Wouldn't it be nice to have several thought leaders in your industry know and love your brand? Start a podcast. Invite your industry's thought leaders to be guests on your show. And start reaping the benefits of having a network full of industry influencers. Learn more at sweetfishmedia.com. You're listening to B2B Growth, a daily podcast for B2B leaders. We've interviewed names you've probably heard before, like Gary Vaynerchuk and Simon Sinek, but you've probably never heard from the majority of our guests. That's because the bulk of our interviews aren't with professional speakers and authors. Most of our guests are in the trenches leading sales and marketing teams. They're implementing strategy. They're experimenting with tactics. They're building the fastest growing B2B companies in the world. My name is James Carberry. I'm the founder of Sweetfish Media, a podcast agency for B2B brands, and I'm also one of the co-hosts of this show. When we're not interviewing sales and marketing leaders, you'll hear stories from behind the scenes of our own business. We'll share the ups and downs of our journey as we attempt to take over the world. Just kidding. Well, maybe. Let's get into the show. Welcome back to B2B Growth. I'm your host for today's episode, Travis King at Sweetfish Media. Today, I'm joined with Jennifer Thomas, who is the Managing Director at Plug and Play Tech Center. Jennifer, what is going on, my friend? So happy to be here, Travis. Thanks for having me. Of course. It's my pleasure. So today, you're going to be sharing how startups can leverage what you call corporate finesse while learning from key decision makers to enable them to learn faster and move their businesses forward faster but also kind of take us through a little bit of the steps that you help startups go through when they're kind of first starting out and selling into to larger corporations. Right. But before we get into that, I'd love for you to share with listeners a little bit about yourself and what you and the team at Plug and Play are up to these days. Sure. Thanks. I'd love to. So Plug and Play um, really is an open innovation platform. We're headquartered in Silicon Valley, but uh, we've opened our office here in Cleveland. And right now, we specifically work with healthcare partners, Cleveland Clinic, University Hospital, and Phillips. And what we do is help them with open innovation. Um, We help them explore the startup ecosystem because there are so many ways to innovate. They innovate internally, but they also want to see what's out there. So we help them explore, kind of scout, evaluate, meet startups. But then it's not just enough to meet those startups. We really want to facilitate how to create corporate value. And that's one of the things that I'm really excited to talk about today. So how do you get to the point where a startup gets to launch a proof of concept or a pilot? with clearly defined solutions, so important to the corporate partner. And then ultimately, I think the startup is helping to transform culture and they need to sort of think about their role in that. Uh, Corporations obviously operate so differently than startups and um, that causes usually challenges and roadblocks. But hopefully what we we chat about today will give some clarity on how to uh, sail smoothly when you're a startup trying to sell B2B. I love it. I love it. So I guess let's dive in. And, you know, first, thanks so much for sharing that background and giving listeners some context um, about yourself and and your company and and what we're looking to talk about today. Um, And so let's, I'd love to start with, you know, what's good to know when approaching a corporation for some of these startups? Yeah. So Plug and Play effectively is doing three things. We scout what we look, we meet for startups, then we help them accelerate. And part of that is kind of getting them to understand how a corporation behaves and, and kind of that corporate finesse is the word that I like to use. We encourage startups to over communicate with the innovation team or the people who they're in touch with. Also, we encourage them to kind of abide by the process. These are kind of the general guidelines that we like to give. Really, pilots or, or the relationship between a startup and a corporation is it's not a mere vendor client. There's so much more going on. It's really built around collaboration and respect. Um, And I think those relationships um, really breed success between a startup and the the corporation they're trying to sell into. And then we encourage the startups to like form a relationship with institutional actors, people who have decision-making, not maybe just the innovation team or the VP of innovation, but someone who... Um, has the budget and the ability to make decisions. And then finally, um, 
we realize that the most successful pilots happen when both sides are flexible. So we tell the startups, be flexible, kind of understand the perspective of uh, the corporation you're trying to sell into and, you know, sort of get your head around their processes because they're going to have to abide by those. Right. I really love that, that point on being flexible um, because a lot of times when you're going through as a startup, you're not really paying attention to everything. And like one of the things that I feel like you'd, you'd add a lot of value in is, is like how they pay attention to that timeline. So right. could you share with us a little bit about like how some yeah. you know, startups can pay attention to their timelines and make sure you know, they're being flexible, but they're also you know, staying on task? Exactly. So timelines are so important because startups are just constantly raising money and they care about finding the funding so that they can hire more people, so they can survive, so they can really you know, iterate on their product and produce something amazing. And time for a startup is money. So when you're a B2B startup selling into a corporation, corporations move really slowly and that is super frustrating. So some of the timelines just to be, we, we suggest that, that startups actually sort of map out how long they think it might take. Um, we found that once our startups get um, into what we call the face-to-face stage where they're actually meeting face-to-face, with a corporation, that it could take between four and eight months uh, for the contract to happen. And sometimes this is called like the pilot period, but you know you have to be able to know, um, are you going to have to do a lot of meetings virtually? Can you manage which, which trip in person is critical? Um, sometimes the corporations really want you there all the time, but understanding um, that it will take time we think that uh, from contract to actually implementation of, of getting things off the ground could take up to two months. So now we're talking maybe eight, 10 months, which is a long time in a startup's life. I mean, things could radically change. And we've actually witnessed that it, it happened, you know, where the pilot happens and we get to contract. And sometimes it is a struggle for the startup, but that time period is really um, important to understand. And We also think that timing can go faster if the startup focuses on getting the right stakeholders around the table. It might be that their their initial contact is not actually the decision maker. We really stress how to get the right stakeholders all together around the table and go ahead and inquire on that and and you'll move much faster. Got it. I I really love that because I think that a lot of times like when you get the right people in the room... And um, one thing that, that I'm also thinking about is, is how can some of these you know, startups and these founders um, and these other marketers address the decision makers that they're trying to connect with? Like, Do you have any tips on how to address the decision makers and addressing their audiences? Yeah. So we found that there are many decision makers inside a corporate partner or a corporation Um, especially in hospitals where we're working right now. So right now um, we're working with digital help and pharma startups and really helping them to launch pilots um, inside hospitals, industry partners and pharma. And we found that one of the decision maker departments is IT. And so it's really, uh, you know, most of most B2B startups have some kind of um, really cool, interesting technology that they're trying to, to develop. And so understanding IT and the decision-making that goes on there is key. So really kind of knowing how your digital solution maybe overlaps with other digital solutions that that already exist inside the corporation, especially in healthcare, we have to care about uh, solutions such as the EMRs like Epic. And then also cybersecurity is really important too. Um, Really even before you start the pilot, of course, uh, our healthcare pilots have to understand HIPAA guidelines and they have to be HIPAA compliant, which is a privacy laws. And then um, really, you know, cybersecurity and data, they have to make sure that, that any data they're using is secure. You know, someone at, at the startup needs to understand how to perform data integration, really implement from a technical standpoint. And what we like to say is know what the lowest level of integration is and what the dream state is. And then how do you actually get there? from the lowest level to the dream state of integration. And understanding that is a big deal because again, all of these startups are um, digital in nature. 
Today's growth story is about a brand we all know well, Airbnb. When they were trying to maximize growth among work travelers, Airbnb knew they needed to develop and execute a content strategy to reach multiple personas at different stages of the customer journey. Enter Hub & Spoke Marketing. Hub & Spoke managed creative content development and crafted a custom publishing process that allowed Airbnb to develop more content in less time. The end result, a lot of content across multiple channels, all strategically nurturing leads through to conversion. Within the first six months, Airbnb nearly tripled the number of companies enrolled in their Airbnb for Work program. They also saw huge increases in user adoption with work travelers booking longer stays and more guests per booking. If you're looking for strategic content at scale, I've got a hunch Hub & Spoke can help. Head over to hubspoke.marketing slash growth to schedule your consultation with a content specialist today. That's hubspoke.marketing slash growth. All right, let's get back to the show. Got it. And I feel like I really love that, like understanding what the lowest level of integration that you need is. Because yeah. a lot of times in startups and when you want to create something new, everybody goes out and thinks like, oh, I have to make this like giant platform, yeah. Yeah. hire 35 engineers. And I'm like, guys, couldn't we just have used a spreadsheet in a document? Like very simply, but a lot of times when you're in this, like we got to build mode, a lot of times you think too fast and you're like, wait, what is the minimal viable integration yeah. that we could possibly do in this pilot to make this successful yeah. to then earn the next stage of this relationship? Right. And really understanding that, that your corporation's existing structure. So, you know, what limitations do they have? Everyone knows that that if you work in a large corporation, at some point you're going to be frustrated with the current sort of uh, IT that happens or a system that you have to use because systems have moved really quickly and not all corporations have upgraded that fast. So just really understanding kind of the, the ground, the, the playing field w that you're entering. Got it. And kind of segueing a little bit into what to expect and you know some sort of guidance on how some of these startups because it sounds like there's a lot of these ideas that are out there but how does one you know set either pricing or set a strategy around like how these pilots go because these take time energy effort yeah. and money so like, could you share with listeners a little bit about you know some tips on pricing and what to expect yeah you know before i get to pricing if you don't mind i'd like to talk a little bit about maybe some understanding some of the institutional actors mm -hmm. that a startup needs to, to really start to work with. But like just familiarizing yourself with the stakeholders, um, like who will be involved is like, who's the manager? Um, who's the champion? Uh, for, for healthcare startups, we say, who's your clinical champion, such as like the doctor or the, or the physician or surgeon? How do they actually work with maybe a workflow champion, someone like on a front line or someone who maybe is in the innovation department who actually helps you facilitate. And then who is the actual internal decision maker? That's so important, right? Because the, the decision maker might be the CIO or somebody who has the budget, yet you might be working on a day-to-day -day with someone in, in innovation or um, in, a, in a very specific department. So really understanding the institutional actors of, of the corporation you're trying to sell into is really important. Again, the person who owns the budget is key. And then as you move along, then you want to start to maybe grab or understand a relationship with the marketing and communication people because obviously they can help to push to drive adoptions as you move along um, with, your, with your pilot or with your contract. And then finally, is there like a project manager, everyone or someone who keeps everyone on task? Mm -hmm. So there are all these kind of different players inside the corporation and it might, you know, sort of get confusing. But if you kind of line up and ask yourself, okay, who will I be working with day to day? Who makes the decisions? How much is IT involved? Who is the person who's my interface with legal? Who's, is there a data committee? Is there an institutional review board, for example, in hospitals? It's so key that uh, any startup has to go in front of an institutional review board, which is a board of kind of directors in the hospital that, that sort of approve 
the moving forward with a digital health solution. So really understanding the landscape of the people is, um, is so key. And, and quick, quick question to add on top of that. How, what, with your, your term corporate finesse, I really love that. And like, could you share with us a little bit about how, you know, people can use finesse to kind of weave their way through that journey a little bit? Yeah. Thanks for asking. So, you know, corporations are institutions that have levels of authority. Um, They have ways of, of approaching challenges Maybe um, rushing to something or being nimble is not always the, the way that they might approach something. Um, they might have guidelines. They probably have just um, maybe a culture. So just understanding how your the corporation that you're trying to sell into, how they behave. You know, the, the person that you deal with in innovation might be sort of really cool and able to iterate quickly in their mind and understands you, but the rest of the corporation might not be that way. So just having a little, it's kind of putting on your suit, (laughs) if you can, you know, kind of dressing the way they dress and maybe um, sort of giving an idea that you're, you know, that you do understand them and you do respect their processes, I think is really important. Got it. No, I love that. And I feel like also too, when we chatted previously, you mentioned how they show up in suit, tie, dress to the nines every yeah. single day in hospitals. Yeah. And sometimes the startup cultures don't necessarily match up with that. So do you have any advice for people that, you know, yes, they want to build a culture where the people are happy to come to work and they, you know, want to dress in t-shirts while they're in the office. But when they go to these, you know, meetings and these engagements with, you know, decision makers that potentially are going to be working with them. Do you have any advice for how nimble they should be or could be um, when it comes to like a, an attire and just like a um, corporate presentation standpoint? Yeah, I would just say, um, depending on what kind of office culture the corporation you're selling into is, as much as you can mimic that to show that you understand them is a really is really key for them. Because as much as they want to be cool and work with startups, they still every day, if they're, if they have a formal culture, you know, showing respect for that formal culture, I think gets the people who are working there to know that, you know, you, you understand them and you're listening to um, sort of the guidelines of, of where they, they have to sort of who they have to be every day. So, yeah, I think it's important just to, just to sort of observe that. And, and many corporations are not like that. They might be really casual and, and that could be tricky too. They appear casual, like they don't dress up and yet they still have a very formal hierarchy or authority or decision-making, you know, really try to sniff that out and figure out, okay, these people look casual. They're a large corporate, but they look like a startup. And yet what, what is the chain of command? How do decisions get made? Who is my, um, who is my contact person and, and do they have the authority? So, you know, just being really observant, I think is important to know your customer. Got it. I really, really love the, the be observant and understand their behavior. And, you know, people buy from people that, you know, are similar to them. And so any way that you as a marketer, you as a startup founder or a CEO, or even a salesperson that is going into some of these engagements, think about how closely you can mimic, you know, the behaviors the actions, the tonality, the messaging, the words, every sort of way that you can align and the more places that you do that, the chances are you might increase your likelihood of, you know, potentially getting that that contract. Yeah. I think that it's important though to to know the line between like you don't have to like fake it right. and pretend that you're one of them. You just have to respect it. That's all. Observe it and respect it and understand that it's coming. And some people might say, hey, I'm not dressing up. I am who I am. Mm-hmm. But as long as you're really observant and you, and you understand where they're coming from and their limitations, it'll help you to be able to penetrate their culture quicker and possibly get to, uh, get to contract quicker. Got it. Awesome. Well, Jennifer, this has been such uh, a great interview. Is there anything uh, before we wrap up? Is there any other points that you want to touch on that you feel would add value to the listeners? Um, yeah, we didn't get to talk about pricing, I think, which is important. Just really understanding 
and, and getting kind of transparency from the corporation, um, what their expectations are and what your expectations are. Again, based on timing, your run rate, how much money you have as a startup to live. I think pricing is important. Be open to co-development. They might want to do that. But also really figure out what does success look like? How do you determine success? And then how does the corporation determine success? What is their ROI that they're looking for? Are they looking to save money? Are they looking to create a new revenue stream? Are they looking to um, really uh, create some kind of efficiency for a certain department? And then that's their KPI. What is your key performance indicator? What means success for you? And defining that um, will help you know that you might have a different key performance indicator. Yours might be, you know, collecting a whole bunch of data and being able to test out your solution. uh, And theirs might be efficiency or saving money. So just understanding those two, because they will be different. Got it. And I really love that too, because now I feel like you're, you're not only giving them, you know, the tips and the tricks and the tools to kind of navigate and use this corporate finesse, but now you're also setting them up for success when it comes to getting the contract. Right. So what, I guess, could you share really quickly a little bit about how some, you know, companies that are navigating like this could, you know, potentially get contracts or what that process looks like really briefly? Yeah. So just quickly, um, usually like you need some kind of evaluation agreement that says, you know, whether the, the, the sort of pilot or the proof of concept stage is free or it's paid, um, there should be a template that you can, uh, that, that around that issue a statement of work describing what the startup and, and, the, and the corporate partner or the hospital are working on together. What are the goals? What's the timeline, metrics, roles? The startups should really create their scope of work um, with the person who's like that champion, their manager. And again, we think that we think or hope there should be some template for that. And then asking them to maybe edit or modify it so that it, it fits both parties. But um, you do want to have all that stuff, obviously, in writing. I think that's pretty obvious to a startup, but just checking off those boxes is really important. Love that. Really, really appreciate that, Jennifer. So for listeners out there, B2B growth has always been about highlighting the tactics, strategies B2B leaders can apply to their own teams in order to achieve explosive growth. So Jennifer, I'd love to hear from you what new marketing or sales strategy your team is currently either taking a crack at or thinking about in the near future? Oh, wow. Marketing or sales strategy. So I guess from our perspective at Plug and Play Cleveland um, and how we approach marketing and um, sales is it's really all about having an authentic product and building strong relationships. Because once you have that, your customers will appreciate what you're offering and they'll come back to you and they'll be able to recommend you to others. So those are really two sort of keywords that I like to use. Be authentic in your product and have really great relationships with your customer. Love it. So you guys heard it first from Jennifer. Make sure your product's authentic. No no fakes, no gimmicks out (laughs) here. And um, also make sure you build strong relationships using this corporate finesse that she shared with us. So This has been such a great conversation, Jennifer. If listeners want to stay connected with you or follow up to ask any other questions on any of the stuff that you shared, what's the best way for them to connect with you? Sure. So um, I would say that anybody could um, sort of reach out to me on Twitter. I'm at Jen Thomas Tweet, or they can email me directly, jennifer at pnptc.com. Thanks, Jennifer. We really appreciate you being on the show today. Of course. It was my pleasure. Such a fun conversation. Good luck and uh, give me a call anytime. We totally get it. We publish a ton of content on this podcast and it can be a lot to keep up with. That's why we've started the B2B Growth Big Three, a no-fluff email that boils down our three biggest takeaways from an entire week of episodes. Sign up today at sweetfishmedia.com slash big three. That's sweetfishmedia.com slash big three. 